Everyone, welcome to the Energy Blueprint Podcast. I'm your host, Ari Witten, and today I have with me uh, someone who is very near and dear to my heart because I've been learning from him literally since I was a teenager. I, I started following his website. Uh, one of the pioneers in, in natural medicine, Dr. Joseph Merkula. Uh, just some quick tidbits about his background. There's a whole lot I could tell you here, but uh, I'll mention he's board certified in family medicine. He served as the chairman of the family medicine department at the St. Alexius a Medical Center for five years. He's trained in both traditional and natural medicine. He was granted fellowship status by the American College of Nutrition in October of 2012. He's a New York Times bestselling author and author of over 12 books and numerous peer-reviewed journal articles. And he has been one of the leading thinkers in the natural medicine community for over two decades now. So welcome, Dr. Mercola. Such a pleasure to have you. Well, thank you for having me, Ari. It's great to be here. Yeah. So uh, I, I want to first start off by having you talk a bit about your background. You were obviously trained in uh, traditional me medicine initially. I'm, I'm curious uh, at what stage you sort of found yourself into more natural and, and holistic medicine. What's the story behind how you, how you gravitated more towards well, that? Well, we could talk a long time about that, but there's more important things to discuss. But briefly, uh, I've always been interested, interested in health. Uh, I started exercising in 1968 and I've been exercising ever since. Unfortunately, the first 40 years I made mistakes and now I think I've I've got a better strategy, but uh, we'll talk more about specifics there later. Yeah, so I went into school. Into I was in the oddball because most of my classmates were there to treat disease and get people better from the conventional perspective, and I wanted to get people healthy. Imagine that. Uh, I was. I think I was the only one in my class who was like that. So I was mm. really kind of branded an oddball. And uh, but I nevertheless I still swallowed the Kool Aid and I became a came out a drug prescribing doctor. That was my primary modality. I had no natural interventions other than to encourage people to eat healthy, at least what my thought was at that time, which was seriously and fatally flawed uh, and closer to, to what represents conventional thinking today. So I didn't know anything about time-restricted eating or uh, the importance of a high-fat diet and, and ketogenic diet and cycling and all that. So. Uh, but then through a variety of circumstances, I realized there was a whole network of physicians out there who were interested in natural medicine and had um, societies and meetings and you know, basically follow the course of going once a month or sometimes more frequently, sometimes less frequently to these meetings and learning on the weekend. This is postgraduate training and developing an expertise for that perspective, taking that knowledge back, uh, sharing it with my patients, getting them better, and eventually in the mid-90s, uh, letting my patients know that uh, if they were not interested in getting off of their medications, they need to find a new doctor. So that vacated about 75% of my patients, and mm -hmm. which is the best thing that could have happened. A little bit scary initially, but then I started seeing patients who wanted to get better and started getting a reputation then locally and then the state and across the country. And then all of a sudden people were flying in from all over the world to see me. So that was the transition. And I realized uh, close to the end of the last century that this information uh, needed to be shared, and I've been uh, passionate about technology for about as long as I've been exercising. I took my first computer class in 1968, and uh, so I was an early adopter on the web. I was first online in about 1995. Uh, back then, when you had to do a modem, actually, I was first online in 1977 when I was working as a transplant coordinator for the Illinois Kidney Preservation Laboratory, and I was responsible for finding the recipients of the donor, the kidney donors that we were harvesting, or the kidney mm -hmm. kidneys that we were harvesting for transplant. So I used the internet back then, and it was, a, it was an interesting experience. And you know, <laughs> I'm yeah. curious what, what the heck the internet looked like in 1977. Well, well, I can tell you, it wasn't much different than when the first PCs came up. First of all, uh, the, the connection device was not an ethernet cable or wireless like it is today. It was a modem, a phone modem coupling that typically... <laughs> The connection rates were ridiculously low. It was like 96 baud's per second. Yeah. And I remember that even in the 90s, that was the case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it wasn't much different. It was a telephone coupler, acoustic mm -hmm. coupler that you had connected. And that was the only way until after like, the, it was towards the end of the 90s that, that, that they switched to a, a different, an integrated modem actually within the circuit board. So uh, yeah, and then you had monochrome monitors, you know, and it was 
big and it was, you know, there was no web, web interface. It didn't exist. It was all just a direct DOS prompt. So mm -hmm. it was interesting. Gotcha. So um, you've, you, you made a distinction there in talking about your background, which uh, I, I don't, I think it's important to, to build this out a little bit more, this distinction between treating disease versus creating health. Uh, yeah. I think among the general public today, most people look to their MDs as sort of in possession of, you know, the most advanced knowledge uh, that there is to do, you know, as far as everything, this all encompassing science around how to fix or heal or cure reverse disease. Um, yet you're drawing this distinction between treating disease versus creating health. What, what is the difference for people who don't understand that distinction? Yeah, it's an important concept. Thank you for highlighting that. Uh, and it's really quite foundational. And the concept is, that is uh, analogy might help ex explain it a little more detailed than that. Uh, if you consider light and darkness, uh, if you have light, you can't have darkness. So similarly, if you're healthy, it's really hard to have a disease. So your body was designed by its very nature to optimize towards health. You have to go out of your way to get sick. Now, Unfortunately, most of the marketing hype in the international or the multinational corporations are all designed to maximize their profits and to, and to, and to essentially uh, cause a catastrophe to your health with no consequences. All these processed foods and sodas and juices and uh, glyphosate and Roundup and pesticides that are in your food, I mean, it's just designed to get you sick. And then the electromagnetic pollutions that we have that's increasing with the introduction of 5G. So it's all designed it's not natural. It's all these unnatural processes. So, but if you provide your body what it needs with respect to the uh, optimal diet, sleeping, not in times when you're not eating, which is almost as important as what you're eating, and getting the proper exercise and sunlight exposure and movement throughout the day, your body has no choice. Its genetic code will prompt you to get better. I mean, there, I mean, there there are some circumstances where you have certainly genetic defects which are not that common most of the problems genetic problems are epi epigenetic manifestations which can be relatively easily fixed if you know what you're doing but there's a few circumstances where you have to have really advanced knowledge and and even in those circumstances most all conventional physicians uh, physicians have no clue they are beyond clues because they were never trained in the understanding the fundamental reasons why people get sick all they are trained in all they are trained in is symptomatic treatment with expensive band-aids, symptomatic band-aids that in no way, shape, or form treat the underlying causes of disease and will fail to stop the, 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 the underlying disease from progressing and they, the individuals will eventually die prematurely as a result of not addressing the cause. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so uh, first of all, I agree with everything you said there. Um, I, I just want to highlight that I think a lot of these physicians are not necessarily going into it saying my goal is to, you know, treat symptoms and create band-aids. They actually oh, yeah. believe they're, they're in pursuit and they're on the path to curing and reversing disease. I think that the distinction yeah. is they're, they're <laughs> okay. treating disease. I don't know that they're thinking they're reversing. Maybe they are. I mean, well, I, th I think right. they think they're on the path to let's say pharmaceutical cures for disease. Um, so, the the distinction as i see it is like a philosophical it's it's at the paradigm level it's like one paradigm here says let's study in as much detail all the biochemical mechanisms of this particular disease and then figure out what biochemicals are abnormal what processes are sort of going awry and then let's develop a pharmaceutical intervention that interrupts this abnormal biochemical process that's kind of that paradigm um, and the paradigm you're talking about i think is which I share with you is fundamentally different, which is what are the factors that create health? And just as light banishes darkness, when you do the things that create health, you create homeostasis and better function through all of the different nodes of the network of the body and you optimize the entire system and then the body tends to reverse disease on its own. 
Yeah, having gone through the conventional system, I can assure you with the highest degree of confidence that virtually every medical student goes into it for the right reasons. It's very mm -hmm. few that want to be scamsters. Yeah. Fraudulent. And they truly, sincerely desire to help people and get them better. But the system is absolutely designed to brainwash and manipulate them and to, and to push them into pharmacological model. And they just have excluded all this nutritional, natural approaches from the, the curriculum for the over the last century, largely as a result of the Rockefeller and Carnegie, Carnegie foundations at the, the turn of the, the 20th century in the early 1900s. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Fascinating. So um, you've been doing this for a very long time. You've had interest in exercise, natural health since you said the 60s. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm curious over that span of time, what have been the biggest things that, you know, let's say when you started Mercola.com back in 1997, what were some of the things you were preaching then that you feel you were wrong about? And how have some of your, your views changed over that span of time? And, and maybe also, what were you right about? I was right about a lot of things. Uh, long before conventional medicine finally caught up, I, I was, I'm sort of proud of the fact that we were, little, we were the first public voice to announce that Viax was going to kill people prematurely. I announced mm -hmm. that in 1999, actually before Viax was introduced into the marketplace. Mm. Uh, you may remember, may or may not remember. I do it. remember it, yeah. That was a drug that killed 60 million, no, 60,000 people, sorry, not 60 mm. million, 60,000 people dead from strokes. Mm. And it was very clear from the early uh, studies on the, that were published that the, from Merv that this was going to be a catastrophe and, and we warned people not to take it. So we were right about that. It took, of course, it took a while, years before it finally came up and they voluntarily withdrew it from the market. But we, we, we actually catalyzed the interest in vitamin D, which now is pretty widely adopted by even conventional medicine. Uh, unfortunately, they got it screwed up a bit. They're recommending supplements most of the case, most mm -hmm. of the times when that's not the way you're supposed to optimize vitamin D levels is by exposing your skin mm -hmm. to the sun, which the dermatologist will tell you will kill you prematurely by causing you to have melanoma, which is... Yeah. I want to flag that as something to come back to and, and build out more, but I'll let you. Yeah, so, you know, that is, that is a, a key, key point that we were on. And, uh, you know, my views on diet have changed quite dramatically. At the ninth, in the late 90s, I was unaware of ketosis, other than uh, probably hearing about Atkins. Atkins published his main book in the late 90s, early 2000s. And actually, he passed away after I published my first book in 2004. Uh, and and he was the most visited natural website, and then we replaced him uh, right after he passed away, I think. So um, we've been number one ever since, the most visited, uh, even to this day after the Google censorship, which hopefully we can talk about too. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I switched to cyclical ketogenesis, the understood the importance of time restricted eating, which I was clueless about. I didn't understand about partial fasting. I thought fasting itself was dangerous and was really. Uh, should be avoided as like a plague, but then I didn't, that's because I didn't understand autophagy, which is just is nothing short of magical. And now I only eat four hours a day and I encourage people to restrict their eating window to at least eight hours and preferably six. So that's almost as important as getting rid of soda and juice and switching over to healthy water. So those are, that's probably a highlight of the major components. There's a lot of other sub ones in there. Uh, I mean, I didn't understand it when the site first started. I mean, glyphosate was being used. It didn't probably wouldn't couldn't have told you what it was in the late '90s, and uh, gradually came to appreciate that it was one of the most pernicious toxins we've ever applied to the environment at the mm. rate of about nearly five billion pounds a year annually, contaminating essentially the entire planet, devastating our environment. I mean, it's just <laughs> it can get pretty sad when you think all the things we're doing to damage. Mm -hmm. The plastic pollution and the microplastics that gets into the food chain and eventually into you, which has devastating consequences. And then uh, global uh, warming. And uh, it's just, I mean, we, we humans have done a pretty good job of destroying the environment and making it an unhabitable or a less than optimal place to live. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, your site, Mercola.com, has been the natural, uh, the number one natural health website in the world. Uh, well, most visited. Number one implies okay. a, a subjective interpretation, right. and but, so, but objectively, we're the most visited natural health site. Okay, so let's go with those more objective wording. Yeah, um, you can't dispute the numbers. Right now, you've had I think it's something like a hundred thousand articles that you've published over 
uh, probably. I, I've, I've lost track. It may not be that many. Sometimes we pull them really the real old ones. But we publish, we post three articles a day. So that's a thousand a year, over a thousand a year. Probably post a lot more than that. So over 20 years, that's 20,000. So it's probably somewhere between 50 and 100,000. Okay, gotcha. And uh, so it's the most heavily trafficked natural health website. Mm -hmm. Is it still that or because uh, yeah, so what, what I yeah. want to what I want to talk about now is basically this massive Google censorship campaign. Yeah, that started, just to give you uh, an idea, one somewhat objective bar barometer of the popularity of the website is, is a site called Alexa by Amazon. Uh, I think it's Alexa.com and you can go and look up the, the worldwide ranking of the site. So if you use those metrics, uh, at one point we were in the top thousand sites in the world. Uh, and when about that time, there was 10 other natural health sites that were in the top 10,000. Now because of the Google censorship, we are the only site that is in the top 10,000 and our ranking is still under 9,000. But you know, we used to, we used to be consistently about two or 3,000 for many, many years until Google started hammering us and taking us out of the picture, which is, you know, it's part of their policy. It's not, they're, and I don't want to say, woe is me, because they're not just picking on me. They're doing this to many, many, actually most of the prominent natural health sites. Mm -hmm. So so why? I, I, and it's Google, it's YouTube. Um, I think well, Amazon Google owns been involved. YouTube. Right. Well, well, and it's interesting, they're the one, number one and number two sites in the world, most mm -hmm. traffic sites in the world, yeah. the entire world. And I think Amazon has been in, in the mix here. So why, why is well, this? Amazon doesn't is not well they have a minimal law of censoring with respect to taking some anti-vax movies out of their video streams but okay they, but they haven't censored books they're not that level yet i don't think amazon is even approach a fraction of the censorship that google has okay so let's just talk about google and, and youtube yeah. then why why is google censoring natural health websites what's the the sort of behind the scenes uh, well guess what i'm not behind the scenes so i don't know all we can tell very truthfully is that they're doing it. So the motivations for it, you know, you can only speculate on. Uh, it's interesting that now when you type in these uh, terms to search for, rather than finding sites like mine or mine specifically, you'll find sites that are essentially monetizing Google because they, they have this uh, Google ads in them. So they're almost all pharmaceutical sites with Google ads on them. Uh, so you could speculate, you don't know for sure, because you know, you're not in their boardroom, why they're doing this, but it appears there may be a financial motivation and they're, they're, it is a risk, you know, and they, they even warned of this risk when they, they first came out. You know, my site was out two years before Google started their site, mm. by the way, just an interesting aside. And when they first, it was very, I mean, it really was a magnificent site it was a world changing site because the problem early on especially pre-web is to find something how are you going to find it especially without a uh, a web interface like we have we have now i mean everything's at the internet they think of the world wide web mm -hmm. and you don't say it anymore because it's been around for the last uh 10 25 years uh but before it was just a, a command prompt and it was there was no graphics it was just a line and you typed and you had to find so it was really hard to do and then even when you got the graphical interface, you'd have to find stuff. And you, you, these original search engines were pretty bad. I mean, Yahoo being one of them, Alta Vista was another, and there was, a, there was loads, and they were, it was, they were just a bunch of garbage that didn't really provide good results. And Google really changed all that. They had a, it was a magnificent thing, and they did a good service for many, many years. And, uh, but they, did, they, run, they ran the – I mean, anytime you – they acquire lots of power. They're probably one of the most, they are the most powerful monopoly and they are a monopoly in the entire world. There's never been a monopoly in history like Google. Uh, and unfortunately, they're very clever, very sophisticated. They control many of the revolving doors in the federal regulatory agency. So for instance, the Department of Justice, which would be the appropriate federal agency to uh, regulate them is now headed by one of the former Google lobbyists. So what can you do when the federal government is is really manned by their former employees you know they're not going to do anything so you've got the state attorney generals all seeking to file suit against google but you know, ultimately it has to go through the department of justice so I, I i'm not very hopeful that they're going to get very far because google's, google's clever i mean they yeah. you're you're not going to certainly see the fcc do anything from them and and they've been fine 
billions and billions of dollars in Europe, but they've never been fined anything in the U.S. because they control the regulatory agencies. Yeah. Now, having said this is this is speculative. I'm curious what what is what do you think Google has to gain by censoring natural health information? Well, it certainly benefits their advertisers. It essentially, we're competition to them. You know, the largest industry in the entire United States is pharmaceutical industry. No, it's actually well, more generally, it's it's health. I mean, okay. we have a three trillion dollar economy just in just in healthcare, right? So, uh, pharmaceutical, of course, is a big chunk of that, but there's a lot of other chunks in there too. And when you have solutions that are relatively inexpensive, simple, effective, and radically reducing the cost, that's a threat to the bottom lines of many of these big companies. Mm, gotcha. Okay. Well, what do you plan to? I'm just curious. What do you plan to um, to do in response to this? Well, I feel it's my responsibility. You know, we, we met, per, I've heard of you before, but we first met at Mindshare in San Diego a few months ago, mm-hmm. or less than a month, maybe a month or two ago, recently. Yeah. And um, I heard a lot of stories there, and some, somewhat similar to what you, you shared, where I certainly inspired people like you to go out there and make a difference, make a dent. But then I also heard stories from people who specifically found my site, and it changed their lives. It, it prevented them from a health disaster, from dying prematurely. It helped their child not do the same and recover from autism and essentially changed their entire life when traditional medicine had failed them. Mm-hmm. And I've got story after story after story. Every time I go out, I get these stresses. This, this I'm not saying that to brag. I'm just saying that the system works. When, when it was a free, non-censored environment, people were free to choose and understand and try whatever they want. Now, that freedom is gone. It is censored. So the people, unless you knew about these options before the censorship, you're not going to do that. So I'm incredibly powerfully motivated because it's not just my site. It's just all these others. Your yeah. site, I don't know if you're affected yet. I, yeah, I've been hit a little bit by it, but I think yeah, I'm you, not. You, you my will. site is, doesn't have enough organic traffic to be really on their radar like yours was. Yeah, or, or yeah. so others. they'll get all of us, you know, and I am so grateful that there's Many other people like you that have gone out and really spreading the truth. It doesn't have to be me. It just has to be the truth. That was the intention. The mission was to, to, to minimize needless pain and suffering and premature death. I mean, and that's what you can do with these techniques, as you well know. Mm-hmm. So my, one of my new um, goals, and I think we're going to do it. I have just was, had a long call this morning with my chief programmer. We're going to spin off a search engine, and it's going to be a simple engine. It's going to be... Uh, by invitation only, so sites like yours can come in and probably pay a minimal fee, like you pay a domain registration fee, fifty hundred dollars a year to pay for the cost, and then we index everything. And, and essentially, we'll have all, every site's invited unless they're a pharmaceutically based site, and it will just be help. That's it. No other things is not ah, going to be beautiful. I love that cars idea. Cars or you know, help. It, it has to relate to health, and yeah. it could be my body spirit. So it could be meditation, other strategies that you can use. It's not going to be restricted to diet or exercise or anything like that. But any, any, it's a pretty broad category. And, and, and we hope to have some system in there to, where it could be self-policed. And the beautiful thing about this is that there will be no violation of your privacy. Your data will not be sold. And uh, it's going to be free to the users. And what was the other component? Oh, and then people can report fraudulent sites or sites that are spamming or doing something illegal so they can be removed. Mm -hmm. So, because that, that's an issue. Unfortunately, you know, human nature tends toward that. There's going to be a lot of, uh, not a lot, but some people who are going to want to take advantage of the system and we have to exclude those. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Beautiful. So it's, it basically, the vision is like to create uh, the health search engine for people who are interested in answers to health and, have some awareness around the fact that there are natural health options. This is to create a place where they can get those answers. Yeah. And the other thing I've neglected to mention is there'll be no advertising. So you're not going to see Google ads on the side. So no advertising, preserve your privacy. So it's going to be free to the user. You have to pay anything to use it. And we're just going to not monetize it, but we're going to pay for it by charging the people who have websites on there. And we Mm -hmm. hope to have thousands, hundreds of thousands of websites available and, and launch this I don't know, it might take a year or two years to put together, but I'm pretty hopeful we'll do it. Essentially, what we're seeking to replicate is Google in the old days. Yeah. That's what it is, except only it's restricted to health. Yeah. So beautiful. in the old days, Google did not have ads and they didn't violate your privacy. But, you know, they figured, you know, eventually they did. And that's where they're at today. Yeah. 
Beautiful. Well, I love that. I'm, I'm uh, looking forward to how I can support your efforts in that regard in, in any way. Yeah. Well, we'll certainly let you know, and you can let all your readers know and that I'm hopefully within a year, but it might take longer. It might take two or three years. I don't know. I mean, I just, uh, it's a, we're just at the beginning stages. We, ever since Mindshare was over, we've been working on it. So Beautiful. So uh, I want to dig into some specific health topics right now. Can you kind of quickly paint the, the big picture overview of how you now conceptualize kind of the fundamental drivers of, of disease or the fundamental drivers of health, however you want to talk about kind of the big picture paradigm? And, and also, I'm curious, uh, maybe you can kind of put special emphasis on where you see mitochondria fitting into that paradigm, because I want to dig into a couple mitochondria-specific yeah. topics. Yeah, mitochondria, I believe, is... And I suspect your viewers and listeners know what they are, so I won't go into a detailed description of what they are. But it's my view that they're pretty much most one of the most foundational pieces of why you are healthy or sick. It's, it's a mitochondrial dysfunction. Mm -hmm. Certainly we know from the pioneering work of Dr. Thomas Seafried that's the primary reason of cancer, which is one of the primary killers of people, uh, is when you have mitochondrial dysfunction. So I became intrigued with this when I first learned of Dr. Seafried's work and started just devouring information and learning this. And I see, every time I see something that improves mitochondrial function, I get passionate about it. And there's lots of things that can do that. So what are they? Well, the first thing is that you wanna be metabolically flexible. And interestingly, I've been promoting this for many years. When I first learned about insulin resistance from one of my early mentors, Dr. Ron Rosedale in 1995, that was a long time ago now. Mm -hmm. uh, 25 years ago, we, we had a little lecture, about 20 people in Chicago, and, he helped, and it, was, it was a new topic at that time. Virtually no one knew about insulin resistance. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, we just didn't. So I, I, I had radical improvements when I integrated that concept into people, into the patient population. But, uh, so that's one of the things that will improve it. But essentially, when you're insulin resistant, you lose metabolic flexibility, the ability to burn fat or carbohydrates seamlessly, the ability to switch back and forth, and to be able to generate a water-soluble fat that can fuel your brain and radically lower oxidative stress, which is ketones. So you can't make ketones if you're well, if at all, if you're insulin resistant. So that's the first one. You do, and you do that by minimizing processed foods, which is probably one of the simplest strategies you can have. You know, 90 for five or 90% of the food people eat are processed, and two-thirds, two-thirds of the foods that people eat in the United States which is not surprising if you go, ever go to a grocery store and look at what's in people's carts, is ultra-processed foods. What's an ultra-processed food? It's food you can buy in the gas station. Mm. Two-thirds of what people eat. It's wow. crazy. So, I mean, that, that, is, that, is an, it, that is certainly a fundamental component. And within that food, there's beverages. And so you, one of the first and most important strategies is foundational stop soda, stop fruit juices, because they're pretty similar. So you don't want to drink solid sugar, like eight, 12 teaspoons of sugar in, in a liquid, because that's even worse than eating it in you know, food. So um, that's a good strategy. But even, and food is, or diet is certainly controversial, but what I don't think is controversial is time-restricted eating is when you're not eating may be just as important as what you're eating, because there, mm -hmm. there's loads of animal data that show pretty clearly and, and convincingly that you can feed the standard crappy American diet to rats or mice and let them have free access to, to that the entire day versus restricting it to only a few hours a day. And you will see dramatic changes in the longevity and the health of those animals. Yeah. Same food. Same yeah. food. I, I would so, say you said you said it's kind of not controversial. I would say just maybe four or five years ago when I first started talking about that concept, maybe actually six years ago. Um, I was actually encountering a lot of resistance to the idea from people in the evidence-based fitness community, evidence-based nutrition communities, where I was hearing a lot of people saying, oh, no, that's pseudoscience. It, <laughs> you know, it doesn't matter when you eat calories. It's just you know, overall energy balance, calories in, calories out is what matters. And it doesn't matter if you eat it late at night or how long your feeding and fasting windows are. And I was like, you know, we still need more data for sure. But there's a lot of research rapidly piling up that is pointing in this direction. And I think you guys are going to turn out to be wrong on this. No, they have turned out. I, 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 in, in my view, there's no controversy. I mean, if someone's Not anymore. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Agreeing with it, I think that the, the evidence is overwhelming. Yeah. 
showing that this is true. And Sachin Panda, P-A-N-D-A, out of uh, the Salk Institute in uh, California, has done some of the most that best work. I love him as a researcher. Mm-hmm. Great book. I think he's wrote, written a circadian clock, his most recent book. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, so time-restricted eating, uh, of, course, of course, focusing on the foods, and then exercise is key. And, you know, I, I, I've only seen you on podcasts prior to meeting you in person at Mindshare. I was really impressed with uh, how you really understand exercise. So congratulations <laughs> on doing that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah it's, uh, you know, really, in my view, one of the key strategies is, I mean, diet is first. There's no question. Because you can't out-eat. You can't out-eat. Wait. You're... You, know, you can't out exercise your mouth is what, the, what I was trying to remember. Yeah. So you can have a, if you exercise the best, best way possible and you eat poorly at the wrong time, you're going to still sabotage yourself. So it's, you got to get the diet right first, but if you're just doing that and not exercising, you are just asking for trouble, especially as you get older, the older you get, the more important it becomes for a lot of very good reasons, all relating to mitochondria. Yeah. Now I, I want to go on a quick digression about like keto and low low carb diets, high oh, fat diets. We can go there. And the, one other, the, the, it's something recent. I certainly was clueless about. No, I'm not necessarily clueless, but I knew about it in the '90s. Was the dangers of EMF because you know it's so darn convenient, uh, cell phones and wireless. But you may remember that our access to the internet initially was all through a wire. Mm-hmm. There was no wireless internet. Yeah. Now it's almost 99.9% wireless. Yeah. So there's some dangers in that. And I've written my next book that comes out in February is called EMF. Mm. It really talks about 5G and all <laughs> the biological damage that happens. So that isn't uh, the reason I wanted to put that in here is it's another variable that will contribute to your health. Yeah. So you can do all these things right. The perfect diet, perfect timing, exercise, eating the right foods. And sleeping and act moving, but if you have lots of EMF exposure, that can t- absolutely trash your mitochondria, and cause massive mitochondrial dysfunction, and accelerate disease and death. Yeah, and uh, we'll also lump uh, sunlight in here, as you mentioned to yeah, uh, yeah. earlier with with vitamin D and and the importance of exposure. Well, and even more important, than vitamin D may be near infrared, which which it powers up the mitochondria through a very specific mechanism. Yes, indeed. I, I agree with you. Written a book on it. So. Okay. <laughs> uh, All right. We're in agreement. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I want to dig into the low carb, high fat, keto stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, there was So there's been a number of studies, as you, you're probably aware of, uh, especially in the last few years, for example, calorie controlled metabolic ward studies, where they mm-hmm. compare like low carb, high fat diets to, mm-hmm. to low fat, higher carb diets of equal calories, equal mm-hmm. amounts of fat loss. Um, mm-hmm. there was a brand new review of, of studies that just came out, I think last month or maybe even this month, maybe September, 2019, that basically is showing there's no difference in long-term outcomes between low carb and higher carb, lower fat diets, um, in terms of weight loss. And then there's, there's kind of, uh, more nuances to, they, they can look at risk of various diseases. There's also potentially, there's some concern being expressed around, um, uh, potentially increased increased LDL, and I know Dr. Michael Greger has written. You know, there's kind of a lot of people in the vegan community kind of bashing the keto diet, talking about you know increases in toxic metabolites like methoxyglyoxal and and things like that. So there, there's there's widespread disagreement about the value of keto. Everything from keto is kind of a panacea to keto is really bad for you and is going to give you heart disease. So why, why are you such an advocate of, of low Let me keep it simple. Most of the studies you cited are, are fatally flawed because when you go into the materials and methods section, you'll find and look at the details of what they're feeding these animals. I mean, it is really terrible food. Well, it's, 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 diet. it's hum, a, humans in this case. Well, well still the same. They're eating, they're eating processed vegetable oils, one of the most pernicious foods you could possibly eat. You know, high fat might be... Sunflower oil, corn oil is GMO and loaded with other, other additives and, and glyphosate. So you've got to be careful about that. So you, there, mm-hmm. you know, I, I would dispute most of those studies. Uh, and then with respect to the, the saturated fat and the, and the dangers of LDL elevation, because you can get that with keto, there's no question. Uh, but here's the, here, I have a good friend who is, his name is Paul Saladino. He's a physician. I suspect you've heard of him. Mm-hmm. And 
if, if anyone's interested in more details, I, I would defer to him, and he's got some great podcasts. He just recently interviewed Tommy Wood, who's an MD, PhD, and they discussed this very topic. The problem with an elevated cholesterol, elevated LDL or LPAs, is that it really almost doesn't matter because the way, the, the mechanism of the, that they cause biological molecular damage is it only seems to occur when there's insulin resistance. If you don't have insulin resistance, if you're insulin sensitive and you're metabolically flexible and you have an elevated LDL, it's not going to cause a problem. The studies which showed those complications were never done in insulin sensitive patients. Mm -hmm. that's, the comp that's the confusing variable that's never discussed. So, so can people identify that just, you know, a standard blood test tells them fasting blood sugar, HbA1c, can, can that be, you know, kind of their clue as to whether their elevated LDL is a concern well, or not? Actually, the best description of metabolic flexibility, uh, secondary to insulin sensitivity, would be the ability to generate ketones. So that if you could measure your ketones the best way, the most accurate way is by bloods, and see what your level is when you wake up in the morning, if it's above 0.3 at least, but ideally above 0.5 or higher, the higher the better. Well, not necessarily, but if it's above 0.5, you're flexible. So you're, you're, not, you're not insulin resistant. There's no way you're gonna generate that ketone level if you work. Okay. So that's probably the most accurate way, rather than, I mean, there's some very sophisticated in some blood clamping techniques that you could use it's and and there's a book written by a deceased uh, pathologist called joseph kraft uh k-r-a-f-t that you can look up on google and uh, i think it's about something about diabetes in the title and he he does go through a uh i think a four or six hour oral glucose tolerance test which you also measure insulin so it's a you know, six hour pain in the butt test to do and you're swallowing 75 grams of glucose so it's not the healthiest thing but if you really want to know you can do it and you can he's got all graphs and tells you how to interpret the test. Gotcha. Um, one of the things you mentioned as we were talking just before I started recording is deuterium and uh, deuterium depletion. And you're, you're excited about the fact that we can measure deuterium in our cells now and that it may be a, a really great indicator of mitochondrial function, which is important because, mm -hmm. well, mitochondria, as you said, are, I agree with you, are the crux of, of health and risk of disease more broadly. Of course, energy um, there are cellular energy generators, so they're very important to you know for everybody listening into this. Um, what is deuterium for people who have never heard of it, and why would m the amount of deuterium in our cells matter to our health? Well, probably well over ninety-five percent of people, maybe ninety-nine percent of people watching this or listening have not heard of it. Mm -hmm. Deuterium is quite simply something called heavy water, which is essentially hydrogen atom, A-T-O-M, that has an additional neutron. So it's got two neutrons and it's twice as heavy. Or a neutron? Yeah. Yeah, I, wait, I know it's a neutron, but I don't know if it has two. It's a, but it's I think twice it's, as I think heavy. It's, I think it's one, if I remember. One neutron, yeah. Two, yeah. Neutr two neutrons would be tritium, I think. Mm -hmm. So essentially it's twice as heavy and, that's, and it's twice as big. Physically, it's twice the size. So why is that an issue? Well, the way mitochondria, most people don't understand the way mitochondria generate energy. They know they create ATP, but how? Well, when it, it, carbohydrates or fats are essentially converted to a molecule called acetyl-CoA, and then it's shuttled into the mitochondria, then these electrons are shuttled through the electron transport chain embedded in the inner mitochondrial membrane, eventually shuttled down to the last cytochrome, and, which is ATP synthetase, and essentially creates this hydrogen ion gradient. And this hydrogen ion, which is regular hydrogen, not deuterium, regular hydrogen, then goes through this nanomotor, which is the cytochrome 5. And once it pops out of there, it creates an ATP because of this hydrogen gradient. Now, that's all fine with regular hydrogen, but the water we drink, the food we eat, sometimes higher, but most of it is at least 155 parts per million. So that means like one every 15,000 of these hydrogen atoms is gonna be deuterium. And what happens is these, these nanomotors are spinning around about 9,000 revolutions per minute. And it's kind of like a transmission on a Porsche and putting a ball bearing in that transmission. You can imagine in your mind what would happen. It just destroys it. I mean, it, you know, thankfully you've got thousands of these nanomotors in your mitochondria and you've got hundreds of mitochondria in your cells. But if you start consistently having or lose the ability to deplete your deuterium, 
which is a function of how well your mitochondria work. Because when your mitochondria start stop working well, it can't create the deuterium depleted water. And that essentially causes the mitochondria to die prematurely. And, it's, and, you, and you go into mitochondrial senescence and, and then you, you lose them. And when, once you lose a critical amount, you, you know, your health declines quite dramatically. So it's not something that like cigarette smoking kills you after a, a cigarette or two, but over a lifetime, it appears to be problematic. And the healthier you are, the more ability you have to deplete deuterium from the food you eat and the lower your deuterium levels are. Mm -hmm. And there are very, very expensive ways to, to reduce it artificially by drinking deuterium depleted water. But for most people, it's just not practical because it's, it would cost you well over $10,000 a year to do that. So let me just, there's, there's a distinction here I want people to get because there's even people talking about deuterium depleted water now, and that might be something someone's aware of. Uh, I was just interviewing a cancer researcher yesterday and yeah. he, was, he was talking about the trials around yeah. deuterium depleted water in cancer. Um, I agree, they, but they work. But as, as you said, um, this is something people may not know even if they've heard of deuterium depleted water, that our mitochondria in our cells can help deplete deuterium at the, at the cellular level. And therefore the, the accumulation of deuterium at the cellular level is kind of an indication of our mitochondrial health. Yeah, I think, I think it may be, it, the, the research is, is embryonic stages, but I think my best guess is it may be the, one of the best indicators of mitochondrial function. Your mm. ability to take deuterium out of your body it indicates how healthy your cells are. Yeah. And uh, fortunately, there are some tests now, so some, some, some pretty good, reliable, consistent labs that can show you pretty carefully what your deuterium is. So this, this is news to me that, th that you can actually measure it. Where, do you want to yeah. mention the name of some of these, these labs that you can get this test done? I, can, I don't remember the name because it's a, it's a relatively small lab. It's just started and it's out of uh, Denver or Boulder, Colorado. And uh, I'm very impressed with it. Uh, there, I mean, the other primary one is, uh, I think, DD, DDW or DDT testing, which is the UCL, UCLA lab in California with Dr. Q Collins, I think his name is, who does a breath test, which I don't like as much. The saliva test is much easier to do and seems to be more consistent and reliable. Okay, well, I'll, con I'll connect with you after yeah. the podcast. And we'll yeah, get I'll there. give you his name and you can, you can put the post the details on the site. Yeah, I just we'll, don't remember we'll, it offhand. We'll, we'll link to it. Actually, I, don't, I mean, I only emailed the, the, the founder and owner, so I don't know what his lab, what his lab is called. Okay. Okay. So we'll, we'll link to it on, at the energyblueprint.com forward slash Mercola. Uh, so if you go there, we'll have a link to it on that page. So um, what did you find? You did a test on yourself. What did you find about your own deuterium levels? I just found out yesterday and the, the lab, when they reported me, the, re the results back to me were astonished. I had the second lowest reading they ever measured. <laughs> and, wow. Uh, and normally you'd only get a reading at that level if you'd been on the deuterium depleted water for a few months, like four months. I was only out for two weeks. So I'll probably have the record, at least from their lab, uh, when I, I'm on it for a longer time. And I think it's because of all these strategies I do, and I don't know which one it is. It might be worth an experiment to see which one it is specifically, because as I said, I've been passionate about optimizing mitochondrial function because it, it is, there is little doubt in my mind that is the key to, to optimizing your health and just yeah. essentially immunizing yourself against disease and dysfunction. You, it's yeah. so hard to get sick if your mitochondria are healthy. Now that, that you know, it's, that's from a physical perspective. Emotional challenges and stressors are another component. They certainly impact mitochondrial function, but yeah. you know, from the physical things. There's a, uh, I did a great podcast recently with uh, Dr. Martin Picard. I don't know if you're familiar with him. He's a, he's a, no pioneer in the field of mitochondrial psychobiology, which is the link. Oh, no, it would make sense. I've not, never heard of that before. Psychology and emotion. So I'll, I'll email Send you the, some of these studies. You'd, you'd love them. They're, they're, yeah. You'll find them fascinating. It makes uh, perfect sense. Yeah, but it really interesting stuff looking at the link between the mind and the mitochondria very directly. Um, so I want to I loop back to something you mentioned in passing before, which is sunlight and vitamin D. And you mentioned how conventional medicine is kind of more aware of vitamin D, but now they're just focused on supplements and you're kind of pointing out the the importance of light exposure on the skin um i'm i'm a big proponent of the fact that the benefits of sunlight go way beyond vitamin d only and so you know it's important that we don't just reduce down the effects of sunlight to just vitamin d 
um, to, to loop this into what we were just talking about, uh, in the podcast I was recording with the cancer researcher yesterday, he's talking about the ability of sunlight to, guess what, deplete deuterium at the Absolutely. cellular level. Mm -hmm. So, you know, all the, just to kind of tie in some of these, these connections, but um, can you talk a bit about the importance of, you know, how you see sunlight fitting into this picture of, of health and why it's, why you can't just replace sunlight with, with vitamin D pills? Well, well, certainly vitamin D. I mean, it's clearly it's probably one of the most important vitamins, although most experts would not call it a, a vitamin. It's really a hormone because mm. it's, it's, a, and it's a precursor of most of our steroid hormones. So essential. you got to have that. But in addition to that, as I mentioned earlier, the near infrared, which is about 40% of the radiation of sunlight, powers our mitochondria. It, it's, uh, I believe it's, I used to remember the cytochrome it hit. But cytochrome C oxidase. Is it C oxidase? Yeah. But I forget, forget the number. I think it's three. Maybe I'm up. No, maybe I think cytochrome C is the cytochrome, and then the oxidase is the enzyme that functions on that cytochrome. Mm -hmm. So it, 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 it powers up that cytochrome to essentially improve the function of that electron transport chain to hash, shuttle the electrons through to ultimately generate the ATP. So that's one thing. And then also, also additionally, the ultraviolet A radiation, I believe, is what can stimulate the synthesis, the synthesis of nitric oxide, a, mm -hmm. a free radical, but actually very potent and necessary uh, free radical to improve uh, vascular health and improve uh, vascular vasodilation and decrease your risk of blood pressure and stroke, a high blood pressure and stroke. So, you know, it's a really good way to, to do that. It's just regular sun exposure. And then, of course, the photobiology of it going into your retina, uh, we know real clearly from this is this is known for decades now that uh, people go through what's called SAD seasonally affective disorder and that's typically uh, a loss of exposure to, to enough bright light in the winter so regular exposure to bright light outdoors would be better than inside with artificial light could go a long way to improving your mental health too and it's, it actually seems to be even better than medication if that's the uh, the the actual cause of the depression. Mm -hmm. Yeah, beautiful. Um, I want to make sure we have time to get into this. One of the things you alluded to earlier is uh, that you were mistaken about the types of exercise that you were doing early on, and yeah. you feel you have a much better approach now. So, so tell me about what you were wrong about and, and what you're doing now as far as exercise. Well, I, like many other cardio exercisers, Mark Sisson being sort of the classic example, who was pretty much a world-class athlete, I think qualified for the Olympic trials, or I think the Olympic team in 1980, but didn't go because of the boycott from, with Russia. Very, very competitive athlete, he ran a sub-220 marathon, I think. Wow. Uh, these people, like he and many others like him, developed, they did this chronic cardio. We, we didn't know back in the 70s and 80s that this was an issue, and they developed these, eventually these chronic cardiac and sometimes even fatal arrhythmias and you have to go have to go on medications for them because it just it just it was a good exercise was too much of a good thing so uh and as you age i mean we've all seen the, the classic picture of the marathoner versus the sprinter which one would you rather look like right who wants to look like a marathoner mm -hmm. or when i looked at the sprinter like you sound both i mean gosh you know there's an interesting netflix documentary on him which is pretty interesting interesting to watch but uh, the guy is, he is ripped mm -hmm. uh, because he's engaging these exercises that builds muscle mass. And the older you get, the more important that becomes. And if you're just engaging in chronic cardio, you're not gonna have large muscle mass and you will eventually, more than likely, especially if you're a woman, develop sarcopenia. And what is sarcopenia? It comes from two Greek words, sarks meaning flesh, penia meaning poverty, and essentially it don't have enough muscle mass. And, People over 60, it's about 25% develop this. And if you're over 80, it's like 60%. So it's like you're almost going to get it. And why is it important? Because it's, it's not just that you want to look good. It's a, it's a metabolic organ. It makes cytokines. It makes myokines. Uh, it actually is, it holds your glucose after you eat. The biggest deposit of your glucose when you eat is into your muscles, 80% of it. So as a result, it helps improve your insulin sensitivity. 
So you need a lot of muscle mass if you're going, and it's, it's actually a reservoir too. So if you get sick, and many people will, and they'll have to go into the hospital, you know, a lot of people who go into the hospital never come out alive. I mean, it's a dangerous proposition going in there. And I'm not saying it to scare, put the fear of God on people, but you really need to be careful. If you have to go in the hospital, someone you love goes in, ideally you need to be at their bedside continuously because medical mistakes are a leading cause of death. These people aren't out to kill the, those people intentionally, but they happen. And uh, the wrong medication given at the wrong dose can easily kill someone and does every day. Every day people die from it. And I'm sure pe most people watching this know this, that there's someone that this happened to. So, uh, but even if you didn't have a medical mistake, you're still going to have a stress on your body and you need a reserve. And if you don't have this reserve, the likelihood of you coming out alive decreases quite dramatically. So, and the studies are beyond clear. Those with higher muscle mass do far, far better when they come out of the other side of the hospital. So you want it as protection. It's your bank account. So, uh, and plus it allows you to engage in life. It increases your health span. Mm -hmm. So who cares how long we live if we're crippled up and our brain is gone, you know, and we, we're in a walker or a wheelchair, which is even worse. That's not a life. You want to be able to engage in the activities you did when you're 40 and 50 years old without pain. Yeah. And that is doable. There is like a, not a micro doubt in my mind that it's doable, but it's only going to be accomplished if you're engaging in some type of activity that's going to provide you with increased muscle mass. And what we've known is that conventional strength training can do it. Certainly that 70 to 85% of your one rep max uh, is the typical definition by the American College of Sports Medicine. And that works. That's a lot of weight for most people and most elderly people that have sarcopenia. There is no way in the world they're going to do that. Or if they're injured or if they're crippled or disabled, paraplegic, quadriplegic, you're not going to be able to do that. So there's an alternative, something I just learned about uh, recently. It's called blood flow restriction training, BFR, uh, initially developed in Japan about over 50 years ago, uh, and called Katsu over there, K-A-A-T-S-U and uh, came to the US literally with this in this decade. Even though it was developed 50 years ago, it didn't get to the US until this decade. It's literally only seven, eight years old in the United States. So that's why many people don't know of it. Uh, and there's a lot of derivatives of it. I, there's, we only have a few minutes. I mean, I could lecture on this for three hours, but the metabolic benefits are profound. It, it is just, it's, it's close to magic and only requires like 15 minutes instead of using these heavy weights of 70 to 85%, you're using like 20% of your one rep max. So for most people watching this, it might be meaning doing bicep curls with 10 pounds. If you're a woman, it might be five pounds, but you do a lot of reps. So instead of doing eight reps, you're gonna do like 30, rest a few seconds and do 30 more and do like ultimately like 90 reps. Yeah, we, we shouldn't give people too much of an impression that it's just about lighter weights and, and easier because it is quite- But you've done, have you done it before, Ari? Have you done it? Yeah. Yeah, okay. I, I bought tourniquets years ago and was doing all kinds of experiments. Well, it, that, that, it should not be a tourniquet. The, the, that's a really important distinction. I mentioned because mm -hmm. a tourniquet could, could cause problems. It could actually yeah. increase the, yeah. blood, the risk of a blood clot. It could also increase a hypertensive crisis and stroke. Mm -hmm. So this is a restriction. So your, your arterial flow is only reduced by 50%. So it's not a tourniquet. That's a dangerous. Yeah. No, no. no. So to be clear, I, I'm not saying that I yeah. use tourniquets in the tourniquet way. I'm saying- well, I don't want any confusion because I don't want to hurt yeah. people. No, I agree. But actually there's a lot of, for example, bodybuilders using who use tourniquets in the gym, just the, the little devices, but obviously you don't use them to completely cut off blood flow, which would be a really bad idea. Some people do. Some of these physical therapists are using them like that. But, you know, oh, wow. so it's a whole other, but anyway, I've written, I was so- massively impressed with the results when I first started it. Mm -hmm. And I didn't believe what the people who sold me the equipment were telling me. They just didn't seem, seem grounded in science. So I, I spent three months and scoured the literature, read hundreds of papers, and wrote a 25-page summary of the science behind it. And I'm going to get it published in a peer-reviewed journal. So I've nice. done that. I've created videos. I've got specific detailed instructions. And you could get them for free on my website by simply typing in BFR, bfr.mercola.com. Great. So you can get all that and it goes, I mean, I've got lectures that I've done before on this and the paper that I'm hoping to publish real soon. So, because it's just extraordinary the way it does it. it and it not only improves muscle mass, but it, it improves stem cell activation, stem cell function. It increases a hormone called vascular endothelial growth factor, VEGF, which is essentially fertilizer for your blood vessels. 
then increases another hormone called BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which is blood or, or uh, fertilizer for your brain. So it, it just me mental clarity, vascular function reduces your risk for stroke, Alzheimer's, heart disease. It's it's like an it's an, it, a true immunization against disease. It's crazy mm -hmm. good. Yeah. And you not to say you couldn't get the same benefits with conventional strength training. Like Ari, you really wouldn't need this. I mean, you can use it, but you don't need it. Most of the people watching this need it because they cannot do what you do. Yeah, yeah. Um, Dr. Merkel, I want to be sensitive to your time, but do you have five more minutes because there's still one more topic that I want Sure, wanna... sure. Okay. Um, so EMFs, uh, you mentioned this in passing already. Mm -hmm. My, I, I really haven't developed a super strong stance on this because I've seen some just conflicting research, some research oh, yeah. definitely yeah. suggesting harm, other research basically saying, hey, this is benign. And you know, some experts basically saying, hey, all the, this is all just fear sure. monitoring and conspiracy theory. So, Like so, Dr. Oz did today, this morning. Oh, really? Uh, yes. Okay. So wh why, you know, your next book is on this. So why are you convinced that well, it is a big factor? Ari, I is exactly your position until about three years ago, because it's so darn convenient. And, you know, who wants to sacrifice this when there, it's controversial? Mm -hmm. You know, they've, they've created doubt. You know, it's, you know what? It's exactly what they did with tobacco. There's a book and a movie called Merchants of Doubt, and there's other books that are similar to that, and they describe the whole process. That's what the industry does. The similarities between this and tobacco are so profound, and it's actually a whole chapter in my book. Uh, and and they, they've essentially, the wireless industry is huge. It's, it's pretty much the same size as pharmaceutical industry. People don't know that. And just like Google, they have a revolving door and they bought out most of the federal regulatory agencies. So, mm. you're the, and the public health authorities, they're not going to tell you the truth because these are conflicted and corrupted regulatory agencies. They're just not out there for your health. And that's why there's this confusion, which is a classic strategy to create doubt and just dismiss it and, and to use it because it's so convenient. Everyone else is using it. No one's saying about it. The media doesn't tell you. The public health authorities don't say anything. And, this, and there's a question in the science. But if you carefully look at it, you will see there are thousands of studies that clearly document this. And I go into the specific biological mechanisms and guess what they do? Guess what they damage the most? The mitochondria. Mm -hmm. and, and they do it in a way that's almost identical to the way ionizing radiation, which is X-rays and gamma rays and, and uh, neutron, not neutrons, uh, uh, radioactive isotopes from, from uh, like uh, radium will do, uh, is that, and there's no controversy there that they cause damage. People have to wear sensors to, to monitor their exposure. But the way that that creates it is there's enough energy in that, those, that radiation to actually directly break and damage DNA bonds. But most of the damage comes from creating indirect damage to DNA, which is through creating hydroxyl radicals in the mm. nucleus itself. But the non-ionizing radiation, which is your cell phone and wireless router, does the same thing. It just doesn't do it with hydroxyl radicals. It does it with something called carbonate radicals because it increases the level of a, a free radical that virtually no one has heard of which is called peroxynitrite. It's, free, it's, not free, free, it's not a reactive oxygen species, it's a reactive nitrogen species. And it, it does this through a mechanism that is still theoretical at this point, but objectively, we clearly see this massive increase in oxidative damage that causes damage to the DNA. And there's just, just no question. The people know, they just don't put the two and two together. You know, all the people they know that have had breast cancer were exactly where the the woman was putting the phone in her bra or the person who died from a glioblastoma, like uh, the most recent was uh, McC McCain, John McCain, and then Ted, Ted Kennedy before him, you know, right where they're putting their phone. So this is, it, it's not rocket science if you think about it. And there's a very compelling story that I talk about in my book, which is called EMF that comes out in February. And uh, so what, you know, I, it's not, the point of the book is not to create fear uh, and people, but to, uh, to know it's an issue. And in fact, if you do all these other strategies that we talked about earlier and you improve your health and you've got good mitochondrial function and you live in a pretty uh, relatively free, EMF free sanctuary and you're sleeping in an EMF guarded environment every night, then when you go out into the world and you're exposed by this unavoidable exposure to EMS, which is good exponentially increasing and you may not know that t t spacex and uh 
I think it's Amazon are launching 15,000 satellites in the next few years to, to shower the entire country with internet service. Mm. It's going to be everywhere. And then you got the, the 5G. Entire, the community. entire country or the entire world? Just the United well, the entire world, but certainly the entire U.S. Because okay. I'm sure that's most of your audience is in the U.S. Yeah. I mean, it's going to be mostly it's going to hit the northern countries first and then it's going to be the south. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's coming. And so you, the key is to stay healthy and to guard your sanctuary, your home. So I put together the most important chapter of the book that comes out is chapter seven, which is how to remediate. And I've taken the highlights of the book and I put it, it's, it's in a pre report that I have available now, literally months before the book comes out. And the, and the publisher provided me the opportunity to give this because I, the book was primarily written to, to share the information. It's not a money maker. I mean, what do you sell? These books are fifteen dollars. I mean, I, you don't make a lot of money when you sell a book for fifteen dollars. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, the report's free. It's at emf.mercola.com, okay. and uh, you just go there and get the free report. Beautiful. Well, uh, Dr. Mercola, thank you so much for your time. I've really, really enjoyed connecting with you. Thank you for the work you do. Uh, you inspired me twenty years ago when I was uh, when I was a teenager, just starting to learn about health and nutrition. So. Thank you so much. I, I really well, appreciate it. Thank you for picking up the torch and spreading yeah. the message because there's people like you. That's exactly what we need. I was hope that I was hoping that I wasn't seeking to be the knight in shining, white knight in shining armor. I knew this was to be a collaborative effort. We knew we'd have spawned up lots of people like you that knew the truth and spread it in different ways to, to people that I would never reach. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you for the, a few extra minutes here. And I, I hope to connect with you again for part two. All right. Thanks. Hey there, this is Ari again. One more quick thing before you go. Just make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, The Energy Blueprint, and also make sure to subscribe to this podcast on your favorite podcast platform, whether that's iTunes or Stitcher or anything else. Hope you guys enjoyed this interview, and I will see you again next week.